Colorado chapter of the American Indian Movement, and from Gwarthy Lass, otherwise known as Leonard Peltier, who today as I speak to you, continues to sit in a cage at Lewisburg, Pennsylvania, not for anything anyone, even his prosecutor has been prepared to say they believe he actually did, at least not at any point in the last 20 years but rather as a symbol of the arbitrary ability of the federal government of the United States to repress the legitimate aspirations to liberation of indigenous people within its claim boundaries. And put the emphasis there on claim. Big difference between claim and a reality. So that takes me to, with all due respect to the organizers and to the institution, and I do truly appreciate the organization of this event. But my honor is to be not on what was originally Onondaga land, but what remains Onondaga land. Now you get official document in this state. It's commissioned by the governor. Nice Republican attorney was retained back in the early part of the 20th century to write a report demonstrating that the state of New York had acquired legal title to the dominion it claims as its own, over which it purports a right to exercise jurisdiction. It's called the Everett Report. What this Republican attorney, who was actually an honest man, irrespective of his political standpoint, what this Republican attorney came up with unavoidably in the end, was that the entire northern half of New York had never been ceded, had never become the property of anyone other than those original owners. Not a treaty, not an agreement, not a 999-year lease, nothing. Ownership remains vested until there is a genuinely, legally, defensible alienation of title and transfer of same. New York State has never acquired it. Welcome to occupied America. Welcome to occupied territory. Welcome to the West Bank, if you want to think of it that way. This is someone else's land. It's being occupied, used to the benefit of another population, another country, actually, to the detriment of the actual owners. That's the essential definition of a colonial relationship. We can all get off into United Nations Resolution 1514 and the open blue water requirement, 30 miles of open blue water, separating the colony from the mother country and blah, 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 blah. The essence of the relationship, however, is the imposition by one country upon another of terms and conditions which deprive the colonized population of the use and benefit of their territory and their resources. So that that territory and those resources can be employed to the benefit of the colonizing power. And it's inherent to that sort of situation that there is a usurpation of the self-governing rights of the colonized people themselves. And an imposition of governing prerogative by the colonizing power. And if you don't understand the nature of the relationship between the United States, the state of New York, and the Six Nations of the Haudenosaunee in exactly those terms, then you don't know anything about the subject. And since you're on their land, you might ought to maybe learn. Just a humble suggestion. What does that make? non Haudenosaunee, who are not the guests of the Haudenosaunee themselves in the sense that they're respectful of the rights and prerogatives of those people within their territory. 
well, there's a couple of words that come to mind. They're jarring and they're jangling. And they'll be habitually referred to as white bashing, although it's not restricted to whites. There's a, some sort of an internalization, a subliminal understanding of the reality of the relationship that caused people out of guilt to repudiate and deny that which is clear as the nose in their face. White bashing? No. When I say words like settler, in the context of colonial discourse, it's not an epithet. It can be used as such, but it's a precise clinical definition. When I say colonizer, same thing. Colonizer is not so often used as an epithet. Nonetheless, speaks directly to the reality of the relationship. And the denial, the pretense that that's not so, doesn't do anything to alter the reality. It simply amplifies in an almost pathological form the nature of the imposition. The colonizer who denies that he is a colonizer becomes the Frenchman in Algeria who pretends that Algeria somehow magically, by a decree issued in the legislature in Paris, became a part of the home compartment, which is to say, France itself. Seems absurd when you frame it in a context like that, with somebody else's country, somebody else's posturing, somebody else's pretension. But the pretension of the French, so that they did not have to allow the decolonization of Algeria, that Algeria somehow was a part of France, is no less ridiculous than the presumption of the United States to pronounce unilaterally and of its own volition that other countries recognized as such by bilateral treaty relations with the federal government somehow magically became part of the United States because that was convenient for the United States. Convenient in the sense that the United States announces its territorial integrity to include indigenous nations which are entitled to a standing separate from and equal to, at least legally, the standing of the United States government itself. Where does that take us? Well, I'll give you a little personal anecdote of where it took me, because I listen once in a while, increasingly seldom, and my visceral vomit reflex kicks in, I find, much too early as I advance in years to be able to actually listen to a speech by George Bush II. <laughs> you know, it's just that way. So I get little sound bites, I get the replays, I get Arthur E. Newman pontificating as a leader of the free world, giving us political philosophy lessons in their evil and they hate our freedom as he takes the freedom away, not just from Indians, but everyone. Yeah, that's the circumstance. But he had a father. Guess he still does. I think the man's still alive. I haven't checked lately. But last I heard, he still had a pulse. And he made a speech in 1990. And the speech went something like this. I'm committing major U.S. forces to the region of the Persian Gulf in order to convey a message. Well, actually, several messages. But in the first instance, that is a message of warning to the head of state in Iraq that we are prepared as necessary to wage a just war. Just war being to compel the relinquishment of illegally occupied territory, to prevent the wealth and benefits that would accrue from that aggressive occupation of someone else's sovereign territory from accruing to the aggressor. And so that legitimate governments such as that of Kuwait, will be reinstated. Now, I missed the first part of that. And all I heard him say was that he was going to utilize the force, militarily speaking, of the United States to compel the relinquishment of the occupied territory, the restoration of the benefits of resources to the people who properly could be said to own them, and that he was going to be reinstating legitimate governments who have been usurped by aggressors. And I jumped up and I started to cheer. I was doing a dance. You should have seen me. I looked absolutely ridiculous even in my own mind in retrospect. But I was absolutely ecstatic because I know at that moment he was calling in airstrikes on the White House. 
the 400 indigenous nations that are illegally occupied, whose resources are siphoned out of them, their societies, their cultures, their ways of life, and taken into the benefit of the colonizing power to support something called the American quality of life. Now, I know that that's a grossly inequitable relationship in American society, however you want to define it, that there is a vast gulf between those who are truly wealthy and those who are struggling from day to day to eke out an existence in this society. Nonetheless, for the middle strata of that, there is a direct translation between the conditions that prevail in native North America and a relative luxury that assigns itself an image at least to the American way, the American quality of life. Eduardo Galeano summed it up very well, although he was talking about the relationship between North America to South, it would be equally applicable here in the context of what we're talking about. And he formulated it as follows. This is in paraphrase, but it's close. Your wealth, he said, speaking from the South to the North, is our poverty. You take the expropriation of indigenous land, resources, and ultimately lives out of the equation of that which purports to be the United States, the economy looks radically different, the resource availability looks radically different, the quality of life is radically different, the entire set of circumstances is, is radically different. And in that radical difference, the ability of the United States to protect itself outward from this internal base it has consolidated, imposing itself in a similar fashion on the rest of the world, is undermined radically as well. If you actually want to oppose the Gulf War, if you actually did want to oppose the United States dominion in Southern Africa, if you were opposed to what the U.S. is doing and still is doing in the Caribbean Basin, or in Central America, or in South Asia, or in Southeast Asia, or I can keep on taking them off, but you know the nature of the global network of U.S. presumption and pretension to have dominion over other people's territories, other people's resources, other people's lives. That whole ability to conduct what they call a process of globalization, if it's to be opposed, should be opposed where it would actually count, which is right here with the base of operations, the consolidated continental block for geopolitical projection that is the United States itself. And the key to that equation, what they never ever teach you in grade school, the most fundamental aspect of the reality of the United States is absent the expropriation of indigenous territory. It does not exist. It does not exist. Every square inch of territory claimed by the United States as its home compartment, primarily the 48 contiguous states, but you could add in Alaska and Hawaii. You could add in, for that matter, U.S. Virgin Islands. How they become U.S.? American Samoa. That's in Polynesia. How did it become American? You could add in Guam. You can add in Puerto Rico. This anti-colonial power is holding those kinds of literal colonies external to itself. But basically, what it is that allows the projection that we were just talking about, that is defined by this current term, somewhat vogueishly, a term that replaces, I th think, what was probably a more proper term called imperialism. So what we used to call globalization. This isn't a new concept. What makes that possible for the U.S. is the consolidation of itself as an internal settler state construction. If you want to fight globalization, if you want to prevent de facto colonization of significant portions of the world, perhaps the world itself, by U.S. state corporate coordinated activity, you need to have decolonization as an agenda. You need to be anti-imperialist in perspective. But that's not something that you focus upon out there. The key colonial imperial ingredient is here. You have an agenda which references itself constructs itself, refers itself to you in those 400 indigenous nations, 
in those sets of treaty relations that were entered into by the government in the process of acquiring at least a pretension of legal title to a good chunk of territory in North America. That delineates the residual holdings of the indigenous nations which ceded the property that might be called legally belonging to the United States. There's a difference between the map that results and the map that you are presented with in school. The map that is presented to you in school shows these little blocks of land colored usually the same color as national forests, parks, grasslands and so forth, federal trust territory in other words, that are referred to as American Indian reservations. If you look at the reserved holding of indigenous peoples under these bilateral treaties, which under the sixth article of the U.S. Constitution are pronounced to be the supreme law of the land, you see that about one-third of the 48 contiguous states' territory was never relinquished by treaty. This is consonant with the finding of the Indian Claims Commission, a federal entity that was designed somewhat like Everett's study of legal acquisition of property in New York State. This one was a federal entity that was supposed to show how title had been legitimately acquired by the U.S. to the virtual totality of its purported holdings. And after an entire generation of study with the full resources of the U.S. Treasury and archives behind it, it had to admit in its final report in 1979 that it had been unable to ascertain any basis, any document, any treaty, any agreement, even unilateral act of Congress taking lawful possession of about 35% of the gross territoriality of the 48 contiguous states. That's one third of the United States it exists in a condition by federal assessment, although they don't broadcast as much, that's their finding. About one third of the continental United States does not belong to the United States. In that one third, you're going to find two-thirds of what the U.S. claims is its own domestic uranium holdings. In that, you're going to find about 25% of the accessible low sulfur coal. In that, you're going to find about 20% of the oil and natural gas. And actually, since those data that I'm just running down to you, which are also federal data, were extrapolated, since those were put out, there's been additional findings in terms of national, natural gas, and so the proportion actually probably goes up. Within that territory is all the zeolites available to the United States. And I'm going to have a quiz after I'm done talking here and see who can tell me what zeolites are. Okay. Other resources from copper to industrial grade diamonds, such virgin timber renewable resources for timber exploitation has remained available to the United States. The preponderance of the water in the arid and semi-arid ranching regions, 50% entitlement to the salmon harvest in the Pacific Northwest. Shall I continue? I said the economy would look rather different if Indian rights were actually respected. It's not just territorial, although that is tremendously significant, particularly given that the indigenous peoples whose property rights have been usurped as a process of internal colonial consolidation by the United States tend to be land-based, take that as a prime symbol of cultural significance, have organized themselves in ways over millennia to live in a condition of balance and harmony with whatever biosphere they happen to reside in. Land's important for the U.S., aside from the strategic position of a continental size or continental scale block of land to operate from, the primary interest is economic. And in economic terms, the economy is unrecognizable when you withdraw the resources attending the land from it. And that's doubly particularly true when you start talking about resources like uranium, not just for purposes of nuclear weapons construction, although it certainly fits that profile, but armor-piercing ammunition, considered to be conventional weaponry, which is made of depleted uranium. Access to uranium is relatively significant strategic consideration for the United States, or molybdenum, the vast preponderance of which is in territory, treaty territories as well, 
Without molybdenum, you don't build airframes. Without airframes, you don't have air superiority. Without air superiority, you might actually have to fight somebody straight up, and the U.S. isn't inclined to do that, never has been. Straight up fight, forget about it. Where do you have your non-combatants situated? We want to go and kill a bunch of them so we can claim martial prowess. How about we take stealth aircraft, brave people that we are, and deliver 2,000-pound smart bombs on specific sites when you can't even see us? How about we develop sniper weapons with hyper-lethal ammunition that will deliver a killing shot from a mile and a half away? Well, that stretches it. Actually, a Canadian has that particular record in Afghanistan lately. But a mile is more customary, so that your target and even people who are with them may not ever even hear the shot that killed them. Now, there's brave stuff. There's really brave stuff. Undermine that technological superiority, and there's going to be a far less inclination to go out and butcher people, because those people might just butcher you back. Individual for individual, by and large, they're better at it because they don't depend on high-tech weaponry, shock and all and so forth to fight, largely because they tend to fight combatants rather than extracting so much pain from the general social order in a manner that was first conceived, I think, in a formal military doctrinal sense by a guy named Sherman in a march to a sea that if you can make the civilian population scream loudly enough, if you can inflict enough pain on the families of the people who are supposedly the fighters, they may give up the fight. And in any event, you'll gut their capacity to fight over the long run, so the entire population is a target. I say that this is put forth in formal military doctrine for the first time with Sherman, in full knowledge that that's exactly the mode of fighting that was conducted against indigenous peoples from the get-go. And anyone wanting not to take the assertion of someone who's obviously as focused on Native rights as I am, because that would be biased. Oh yeah. If you don't want to take my word for it, there's a really good book by an officer in the Air Force who happens to be an associate professor of history at the Air Force Academy right now called First Way of War, which said, in the simple form of his analysis, that too little attention has been paid to the actualities of how early warfare in the America and what becomes the United States and after it became the United States, the modes had nothing to do with the myth of U.S. battalions, Napoleonic formations of armies, great armies wheeling and maneuvers. No, it was ranger warfare, it was ad hoc warfare taken from people who were adept at killing in the woods, who had learned lessons from the Indians to go out and eradicate every Indian they could find. It was Basically, Sherman predated on a smaller scale and small unit action. This is maintained in U.S. military doctrine, ranger warfare, special forces, special operations to this day. But that was the whole of it in the early days, and Indians were essentially the target. This is manifested most clearly, I would suppose, in the promulgation of scout bounties in every single state and territory of the United States, and every antecedent colony, every single one of them, and one point or several, had in place officially policy to pay bounty for proof of death of Indian, any Indian, any Indian. They weren't after particular Indians. They want a proof of death of Indian per se in the form of scalp or bloody red skin. Oh yeah, red skins is not really a racial epithet. It's a reference back to that. No harm intended, no harm, no foul. We're just going to name a major sports team in the nation's capital after the practice of proving death for payment in the form of body parts. If you're going to do it by way of a scalp, bring the scalp with both ears to prove you're not defrauding the taxpayers. Otherwise, you could divide the scalp in two, collect twice. These are actual rules. Big time in New York. You had professional scalp hunters. This is a business. Business. Graduated scale, even promulgated by these legislatures. These colonial commissions. Territorial commissions. Paid on a graduated scale. Pennsylvania in the 1740s. 
I'm going to do the arithmetic fairly simple. It's not quite as simple as this, but this will get the idea across. 40 pounds sterling to be paid for proof of death in form of scalp, bloody red skin will work. You can bring in, you don't need the head because we're not interested in which one it is. It's a scalp. That'll work. 40 pounds sterling to be paid for proof of death in that form of a fighting age male. I guess they didn't care about old men because they didn't really have any special provision for that. But adult male, let's just put it that way. 40 pounds sterling. That's for one. 40 pounds sterling is roughly the equivalent of the annual wage of your, abs, your average Pennsylvania farmer at the time. Yeah. This is big money. 20 pounds sterling for an adult female. A little bit of error embedded in this, assuming that females wouldn't necessarily be military. Well, they could be and often were in indigenous societies, didn't have the same sort of sex definition of role and so forth. But by and large, it would be correct particularly women of childbearing age whose primary activity is continuing the people. Literally, bearing children. Don't fight much when you're in advanced pregnancy. We're coming back to that. Ten pounds sterling to be paid for proof of death of a child, either sex, child being defined as a human of either sex, ten years or younger down to and including fetus. Yeah, because ultimately, if that is born, it becomes an Indian. And the object, of course, is to get rid of Indians. This, by the way, for those of you who want to correlate the word genocide to killing, is about as clinical a promulgation of policy in that regard as it's possible to conceive. Your professional scalp hunter you figure out pretty quick, going up against fighting mage, age male Indians is a relatively risky proposition. You can get hurt doing it. You can get killed. Bigger bounty doesn't do you much good if you're dead. Bigger bounty doesn't do you a whole lot of good if you're maimed and can't continue your career. And the women, by the way, can mess you up too. And the pros knew that. Going up against an able-bodied Indian woman Get you messed up. What to do, what to do? Well, these guys are conversant with Native societies. They're frontier people. They're your James Fenimore Cooper characters. Sort of. Cooper mythologized and valorized them. Nonetheless, there are elements of reality that are embedded in it, and that's who the pros are. Long story shut, short, find a village take a position, be quiet. Wait a while. A while may be a while in a society that's conditioned to see things in 15 second increments. It's going to seem like eternity, but well, these guys will sit there a day two, sometimes three, being pretty quiet. Didn't need to have an iPod, didn't need to have cigarettes. They just sit and wait. Pretty soon, women in an advanced state of pregnancy are going to come down if your position's near water, you're going to see them because that's one of the few things they can do other than carry the child during the period of their late pregnancy. And a late pregnant woman's not going to be able to defend herself very well. In fact, she's not even going to be able to run very fast to get away. Now, kill her. Scalp her. Open her belly. Scalp the fetus. You got 30 pounds, no risk. Almost as good is taking out the fighting age male and running some risk. First way of war, continued way of war. Scalp bounties, scalp bounties serve various purposes. Scalps serve various purposes. Andrew Jackson, Horseshoe Bin, killed so many Indians so fast, his men managed to do that so fast with such efficiency that he didn't believe anybody would believe that they'd done it when they came back. Resolution on that, and this is the guy in your $20 bill being celebrated every time you go down and drop some money in a bar, by the way. Yeah, a revered figure in American history. He had them take wicker baskets 
from the village that they had just overrun, cut off the noses of the slain, confirmed the body count that way, take them back, prove you killed that many Indians, because there's not Indians sitting around allowing you to cut their noses off. Mm -hmm. That's how you confirm body counts in Vietnam. How do they do it now? I don't know. I'm not involved in this war. I was involved in that one. That was ears. It's the same thing as scalps. And yeah, you did get rewarded for it. You got extra R&R. &R. You didn't get paid more. You got time off and out of the field. That increased your probability of staying alive and combat capacity in Vietnam. They had competitions going for who could kill the, most, the greatest number of gooks, as it was put. These aren't human beings, of course. They're gooks. If it's dead, it's a VC. You can't possibly kill a civilian. If you killed it, by definition, it became the enemy. Take its ear, confirm your account, get your three-day R&R to Vung Tau. It's the nature of the warfare that goes into a colonial proposition, as Sartre brought out. He did a study of the American imperial adventure in Southeast Asia in the late 1960s as part of the Russell Tribunal. The way he approached it was by to analyze his own culture, his own country, as well as culture, its performance in a colonial context. Now, he could have done that in the same place in Southeast Asia, because the United States had at that point replaced the French in terms of maintaining colonial dominance in the region. But he went closer, he went to Algeria, the Algeria that had been claimed as part of the home compartment by the French only shortly before. And he used that as the lens through which to interpret the entire process that he was examining. And he said, you cannot, this is the conclusion of the analysis, you cannot impose and maintain an order of colonial domination over any people, anywhere, at any point that I can find historically, other than by commission of genocide. Ultimately, maintenance of the order requires a genocidal effect to be perpetrated against or imposed upon the colonized subject. You have to take their language, you have to take their identity, you have to take their ability to exist in various ways, and that's concomitant ingredients of the definition of genocide. You want to put that one simply, it's colonialism equals genocide. If you have colonialism, you have genocide. And we were just talking about, we have colonialism here. That the whole foundation of the United States is predicated upon imposition and maintenance of colonial subordination, usurpation and expropriation from the indigenous peoples on whose land it created itself. It maintains itself. It built its economy from, and so on. Well, how does this work out? I mean, is this shrill, radical rhetoric coming from a left-leaning, abstract, formerly existentialist, pseudo-obscure, luminary of French philosophy? If you read Being and Nothingness, you know what I meant about pseudo-obscure. That book could have been 120 pages and readily accessible. Instead, it's 900 pages of impenetrable prose that you can dance along the top of. That's Sartre, the philosopher. This is Sartre, the actual engaged individual, bringing that philosophical orientation analytically to bear on real-world context. Is there any validity that we can find validating data out there, descriptive data? Let's try this. I keep relying on federal data. Not because I believe it's more reliable, but probably because some people in the audience will. And also for sake of consistency. If you're going to use one data set, you might as well stick with it. So the kinds of errors that will occur will be consistent errors, and so you'll end up with an erroneously accurate package or picture. That's Gee, what do they call that? Methodology? <laughs> we have proper methodological orientation here. Decide we go from the real experts at lying, it'll be a federal government. Mm hmm. Validated by all the luminaries and professorate who tend to conjure up the data in order to make the arguments for the feds in exchange for contracts and reciprocal acknowledgement of their amazingly high degree of development in terms of expertise. 
Okay. We're, we're, we're not doing Critique of Academy tonight. I forgot. Oh, slip off into that. Hmm. Well, the process that we were talking about to bring colonialism into being in the early phases of its maintenance had a certain impact as reasonably well known. Now, we could tie a few things, go into analysis of Holocaust denial here and how they learned to do what they do. I'm talking about the neo-Nazi types who try to repudiate the reality or the occurrence of the Holocaust. My reading of history shows a whole number of them, but that's not to diminish the one we're talking about here. The neo-Nazis learned their techniques from the Smithsonian Institution. I don't know what they taught you when you all, who are somewhat younger than me, came up in public or private school at the elementary, middle, and high school levels. We only had elementary and high when I went. Doesn't matter. What they taught you is not going to be terribly far off the mark of what they taught me. For 75 years, they said there are a million people north of the Rio Grande. Funny thing, that's North American Indians. And I thought North America ran down to Central America which would include Mexico, but for political reasons, Mexico got lost. And that was the Rio Bravo. They call it the Rio Grande. In any event, you start there and you go north and you include Greenland and you get a million people. Yeah, a million people in that whole area, which meant most of it, of course, was vacant land. Nothing had to be done to anybody in order to take it. It was just sitting there with welcome settler signs Come on over and put it to use because we hate laying around useless and fallow. We need to be developed, which means destroyed. We're dying to have our virgin forest converted into cultivated row crops. We need to have ourselves bounded by stone fences and white pickets. We need corrals, okay, in order to keep the domesticated livestock that replaced the bison and the deer and the other things which were the other relatives, really, occupying the land. We're begging for that because we haven't got any people here to do it for us. Terra res nullius, it's a whole re uh, legal doctrine. It's also a fabrication and a falsehood. And that million people who were here, well, you got varying estimates once people actually began to look at it rather than simply taking lists of numbers, adding them up, and then adjusting them one way or another for convenience sake. Anybody that wants to understand that process, grab off a book by no great Finn of the Indians, Francis Jennings. It's called The Invasion of America. He's got a chapter in there called The Widowed Land explaining exactly how the data was cooked in order to make it appear plausible that there were only a million Indians in this vast domain. Still wasn't population heavy. Once people actually began to look at that, Henry Dobbins came up with about 18 and a half million instead of one. Russell Thornton came up with something in the vicinity of 12 and a half and then he peeled that back. You got varying estimates, all of multiple, multiple times the one million figure. That was a fairly convenient figure for other reasons aside from grounding the notion of terra nullius as being based in some kind of an historical reality. And that was they actually had a body count of live people in the 1890 census. And if you only had a million Indians to start with, then it's only 75% of them had disappeared in the intervening process of, uh, let's see, pioneering and settlement. My, my, how self-charitable euphemisms involved when it comes to conquest, colonization, predicated by invasion. We don't use those words in the discourse properly framed in academia, now do we? But after the land had been settled, that process of settlement, same word the Germans used in Lebensraum politik, by the way. They called them pioneers, good breeding stock that they would replace the inferior, the untermensch, actually, that were being removed one way or another, liquidated, relocated, dispossessed and converted into basic chattel slave labor, and replaced on their holdings by superior breeding stock, that is Germanic folk. Basically the same process here. That would mean only 75% of native people had disappeared mysteriously in that process of settlement. I think 
the public school system now, still using, those are Smithsonian data, that one million number. I think officially now Smithsonian acknowledges there were two, three million people. Maybe even as many as five. Well, when you go to two million, what happens at 75%? And what happens at 75% of one million who disappeared when you start out with three million? And then when you start going up to the actual demographic studies based upon agricultural patterns, known archaeological data and so forth, when you start getting in 9, 10, 12 million, never mind if you follow Dobbins, who said the maximal population would have been somewhere around 18 and a half. See what's starting to happen here in the purpose served by undercounting the population in demographic estimates and rendering them official. It takes the edge off that, what shall we call it, sort of self-representing genocide? Like, what happened to all these people? they got an answer for that one too, but I'll come back to it in a moment. Let's don't go as high as Dobbins. He did say it was a maximal population. Let's don't go as low as Russell Thornton, who's the other polarity on the actual scientific investigation of the democratic, of the historical demographic. Let's split the difference between the two. And for those of you who are from anthropology, you probably know that the way the Smithsonian came up with the one million figure was to just simply split the difference between Mooney's estimates and Krober's estimates. So I now have Smithsonian predication. I could cite to that. So the proper method for resolving this issue is I'll split the difference between Henry Dobbins and Russell Thornton, and I'll say it's 15 million. And if you got 15 million Indians at the beginning, you've got a 97.5 percentile diminution of population as a collateral effect of the process of settlement, which correlates as perfectly as you can get a numerical or statistical correlation to the fact that in 1890, when they did that since told you how many Indians were still alive, there was 2.5% of the land base that was original Indian land base still in Indian possession. 97.5% of the population was gone, 97.5% of the land was gone. And all that remained was under the trust authority and plenary power of the United States. Okay, history. What's history got to do with today? That goes to the residual into two and a half percent. Two and a half percent of the 48 contiguous states and the resources attended to that make the roughly two million Indians that the federal government formally recognizes as being in existence. That number's way off, too. It's about one-seventh of the actual total that Jack Forbes computed. But sticking with the federal data, two million Indians, 50 million acres of land, do the arithmetic, divide one by the other, and what you got is a population aggregate that still, to this day, even after 97.5% of its population was ripped off, out of its control, on a per capita basis, remains the largest landholding group in North America. And that land is largely landed in the late 19th century. They assigned the Indians as reservation land on the basis of it being of absolutely no value that white society could see. It wasn't arable. It wasn't grazable. It was not known at the time to have minerals of any value. It turns out to be some of the most mineral-rich territory on the entire planet. That's how you were ending up with the kinds of numbers I was given a little while ago. It's possible to take the estimated resources that still remain within reservation land and assign it a dollar value based upon market conditions. It would be a complicated exercise, but it could be done, and they do complicated economic exercises every day. This is one that they haven't had any particular interest in doing. But you can come up with an aggregate dollar amount in terms of the mineral wealth, and you could assign a numerical value, that is a dollar value to the renewable resources, the replenishable resources, at least in theory. They call water that. They call timber that. They call salmon harvest that although salmon are just about fished out of existence, and it wasn't by Indians, it's been by commercial fishermen. Still, you've got a nominal value you can assign to each. Now, you take that 
whatever that humongously large number is going to be, and you divide that by two million Indians, and you got the absolutely wealthiest population aggregate in North America. There's a few Indians around upstate New York. You might not pay any attention to that fact. Then again, you might, because you're here. You ever met a really rich one? Now, we're not talking Rockefeller rich. Rockefeller's from New York, right? We're not talking DuPont rich. That's from New York, too, isn't it? We can keep ticking off a few New York family names here. We're not talking about Indians being, on an individual basis, that kind of wealthy. Nobody should be. That's obscene. But we talk in terms of the way the dominant society measures wealth. Indians are on a per capita basis, far and away, the wealthiest population group based against resources anywhere in North America, probably in the world. And essentially, the reality is, even though we've got bingo palaces and gaming casinos licensed to resolve the debt of the state of Connecticut and so on, even with that in the picture, the reconstitution of national economies on the basis of bingo, even with all that, Indians are still, by a decisive margin, as a population aggregate, the poorest. And the difference between that potential wealth and the practical reality of endemic impoverishment, we're talking third world levels of impoverishment, on a number of reservations. I work a lot on Pine Ridge, which is rough climate. And when I started working there in the early 1970s, the per capita income was 1,200 bucks a year. And in adjusted dollars, it's pretty much the same now. And yet the minerals have been mined, the land has been used, the water gets utilized, the timber gets cut, the salmon get fished out. So it's not that the wealth hasn't been translated into these abstract numerical dollar terms. It's just that it was a flow through for Indians. How do you explain that? You explain that on the basis of the colonial relationship. And that validates, if you want to think about it, the whole main point that Sartre was making in the correlation between colonialism and genocide. Because life expectancy for a reservation-based American Indian male, 10 years ago, you can trust me that it hasn't changed that much. I think it's probably a little longer now. In early 1960s, it was 42 years. 10 years ago, it had come up to 44.6. American Indian women on a reservation tended to have a life expectancy about three years longer. Ten years ago, the average life expectancy for a general population male was 71.8 years. The life expectancy for a general population female was eight years longer than that. So American Indian men, in terms of life expectancy, lived about, on average, one-third, well, two-thirds of the overall life expectancy. They were losing one-third of the lifespan. Women were actually worse off. They were living three years longer, but proportionate in comparison to G-pop females. Proportionately, they were living less long. Eight-year greater life expectancy versus three. So they were getting harder, hit harder than men in comparison to the general population. Like I say, I expect there's been something of an increase in life expectancy on the reservations in the intervening 10 years. I've heard various numbers, none of which I can confirm, but it's going to be 50 or less. And male life expectancy in the GPOP has gone up a couple of years in the intervening 10. So it's going to be proportionally about the same. That is to say that every time an American Indian of either sex dies, you've just lost about one third of a lifespan. And since that was not a new phenomena, it had been going on throughout the 20th century. You can date it back into the 19th, ever since the reservation period began as a result of the Indian Wars stopping. It's continuous throughout that entire period. You can say every time an American Indian baby is born on a reservation, one third of a lifetime just got lost, because that's the predictable outcome. It hasn't really changed in a century. And the conditions, the relations, the everything that goes into making that the reality hasn't changed either. 
and it's by and large out of sight and out of mind because George Custer and the 7th Cavalry aren't doing their bit of riding in with the long knives and slicing up people in villages. No, this happens through the normal functioning, the structural functioning of the system that defines the United States. One third of a lifespan, you can compute another way. And since it's a constant, it's probably appropriate you should. That's the equivalent of a 35th percentile annihilation of the population. A 35th percentile of annihilation of population in a policy-driven fashion is a clinical definition of genocide in physical terms. Never mind the cultural impacts and all the rest of that that I really don't have time to go into, but maybe we'll get to some of them in Q&A. Colonialism equals genocide. The existence of the United States, forget what it's doing out in the rest of the world, is contingent on colonialism here. If you want not to be complicit in the process of genocide that is being carried out in your name and demonstrably to your benefit, you have first to cognate the nature of the reality and then fashion a response which is a meaningful effort a not convenient necessarily effort, an even unpleasant posture of resistance to an engagement in a process of repeal of the colonial relation. Decolonization of Native North America is not a solution to the ills of the world. I'm not arguing that. What I am arguing that all the socially progressive or constructive agendas that I've encountered in my adult life, where it be to counter sexism, or classism, or militarism, or ageism, or any of those isms and ologies that we take to be the enemy. All of those things, as they exist in this society, in your lifetime, are absolutely contingent upon the maintenance of colonial domination. And guess what? If you can conjure in your mind, as I know most of you can, all you have to do is take the right pill and all the fun and groovy, touchy-feely, nice stuff comes together. And I know from all the smiles out there that most of you know exactly what I mean. So sort of figuratively take the pill and then conjure up this pleasant world in which all those isms and ologies that you're opposed to were abolished. Is that the end of the script? If it is, you're destined to reconstruct everything you just vanquished because you would not have addressed the fundamental issue upon which privilege and the rest of it is constructed primarily here, the fact that you would have rearranged your society on the basis of an internal colonial domination of people until you address the colonial equation, you're simply fighting symptoms rather than causes. As long as the mentality is one of entitling yourself by some sort of divine right to that which belongs to others and even to the point that they depend for sustenance and survival. If you see yourself as somehow or another entitled to creature comfort at the expense of the maintenance of another culture or another people, you are locked into a genocidal mindset and of course on that basis, all those isms and ologies come out of subparts, and you yourself are destined to repeat what it is you purport to oppose. You've got to come to grips with that. You've got to take First Peoples, First Nations as a first priority in terms of your agendas and your prescriptions for how to solve the situation in North America. And solving the situation in North America is the absolutely essential ingredient to solving the problem that is manifest in globalization. The key is here, it's not the solution, but there is no solution possible without it. I think we all can agree that solutions to various of the things that were mentioned there, whether they're the sexism or the ageism or the classism or the militarism, whatever your particular thing happens to be, the melting of the polar ice caps for that matter, you can lump them all together and say, we can agree they have to be solved and this is an essential aspect of solving that. We owe it to ourselves to do what's necessary to affect resolution to these things, although those might not be achievable in terms of the manifestation of result within our lifetime. We owe it to our children, and children's children, and children's children's children, 
It's a traditional native way of viewing what your responsibility, your obligation in this world are. To do such things, comport yourself in such a manner as you are able to hand on to your children seven generations in the future. Those who will come beyond you, a world that is habitable and sound. And we don't have one today that just simply redoubles the urgency of meeting the responsibility to face the reality of what confronts us, do what's necessary to turn the trajectory into the opposite itself so that if we cannot hand the world we would like to the seventh generation in the future, we can hand along something much closer. Much, much closer. That's not only a right, it's an obligation. I think it's an obligation you can agree we all share. And on that basis, we can have, in mutual respect, something resembling a common front against a common oppressor. That's a different consciousness than we have now. It's something we need not only to aspire to, but to realize I think we can. Mutakwe